God created the heavens and the earth, when we first hear the voice of God, it's in the context of creation, that with the very words of his mouth, as the psalmist says, that the heavens and the earth were, were given form, that, that when the earth was in its, its original state, that he, just by opening his mouth to speak, the voice of God caused all things to come into existence. Let there be light. Let the earth be crawling with beasts. Let the seas be teeming with fish. And so the voice of God is, is first heard there in that first early week when he creates everything up to and including you and I, human beings, there on the sixth day. And on the seventh day, God rests. And on the next day, or some day after that, it, it all goes wrong. When sin enters the world for the first time, and the voice of God that gave birth to everything now cracks with emotion at the, the loss that has happened because of man's willful rebellion against his creator. And so every day since that day, when, when our ancestors were removed from the very, very presence of God there in the garden, we've longed to hear that voice again. And, and the good news of God's great story is that every day since then, he's been calling out to his people through various means and various stories that we find here in Scripture that the men who, who comprise the stories of what we call the Old Testament were all longing for that experience again to actually capture that, that, that sense of, of having the intimacy restored with God. In, in the prophets, for example, we, we see over and over again that the prophets actually spoke with the very voice of God. It says in almost every prophetic book, it says that the word of the Lord came to Isaiah or came to a particular prophet. And so every single prophet spoke with the very authority of God's voice. But for the 400 or so years before the, the, the birth of Jesus, what we hear is a, a great cacophony of silence. That the voice of God seemed so very distant. They, they still had their scriptures. The people of Israel at the time of Jesus occupied their promised land, and yet they never quite felt at home. There had to be a new hearing of God's voice. There had to be a new story unfolding, or, or that God's story would take new shape and new direction. And so in John's gospel, the very first words we read don't trace Jesus' ancestry back to Mary and Joseph, but go even further before creation even began. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you were reading that in the ancient world, from the Jewish mind, you'd hear that very clearly as God's voice of creation. If you were reading that with a Greek mind, you'd hear that as the very voice of wisdom. And, and both those things, that the power of wisdom and the power of creation are both there, present in the very person of Jesus. And the most startling thing of all is, is that all of infinity is, is represented here in infancy. And so the voice of God is not merely present in its articulation, but also in the incarnation, that the Word actually took on flesh and blood and sinew and, and a human form, that as the child would grow, he would walk this earth, he would live the same kind of life that, that you and I do. John 1.14 says that the Word became flesh, and the word there, if you're reading it in the Greek, it says that he actually took up residence among us. It means that God literally moved into our neighborhood. It means that, that God himself would actually come down in human form, and he would actually live like you and I live. He would be tempted like you and I are tempted, yet without sin. 
He would experience suffering like you and I experience suffering, and even more so going to the agony of the cross. That was Jesus' life. John 1.18, John goes further. He says that, that no one has ever seen God. But Jesus, the one and only who's at the Father's side, has made him known. And, and the word, the language he's using here, again, is reflective of the fact that if you're, if you're a scholar in that world and you're trying to parse out, understand all of God's story, well, John's saying that everything about God's story is here present in this person called Jesus. That, that Jesus would himself be the true voice of God, the true wisdom of God, the true king, the true shepherd. Everything about God we find here present in Jesus. In our world today, we have a world that, that's searching for, for a personal relationship with God, and yet it's never been more confused about the person of Jesus. See, a generation ago, we were asking the question of whether or not we should believe in God or not. Has, has science replaced the need to use God to explain the intricacies of our world? But, but in today's more spiritual context, we're asking a very different question. It's no longer, should I believe in God or not? The question is now, what kind of God should I believe in? And, and John doesn't leave that question to personal preference or ambiguity. He says that everything that you believe about Jesus, you also believe about God, and vice versa. Which means that when we look at Jesus, when we look at this child in the manger at Christmas time, we're not merely seeing a story that, that, that's used to sell Hallmark cards or, or write some clever choruses that we can go caroling. We're seeing a, a, a much larger and eternal story it's now coming down to be flesh and blood, to be real for each and every one of us. And, and that's why Christmas time is so strange that, that we, we do these odd sort of rituals to kind of uh, uh, capture this warm, family, cozy feeling when in reality what we're looking at is a story that's so much bigger, so much fuller than, than any of those things can possibly capture. He says later, and Jesus himself says in John 12, 35, that the very glory that Isaiah saw is now present in himself, that Jesus is the, the glory that Isaiah saw. When Isaiah saw God in the temple, you know what he said he looked like? He didn't. He couldn't. He said that the, the train of his robe filled the temple. That's all he could describe was the very bottom of, of God's robe. And, and everything about that is, is found here in Jesus. I love what my friend Jared said on Facebook this week. He, he, he wrote, he wrote that, that God's glory fills the entire earth, so you can't stuff Jesus back in the attic after Christmas time. And that's true. That, that when the Christmas season ends and, and the lights are, are packed away, what will sustain us for the journey ahead? It, it, it can't merely be the Hallmark card. It can't merely be the, the good old-fashioned hymn or carol. It, it has to be a much larger story, a story that, that begins and ends in eternity. It, it, it must be a story that goes far beyond and far deeper than any of our cultural stories and depictions of what Christmas is supposed to be like. See, see the whole Santa Claus, I mean, Santa Claus promises to, to give gifts to good children, but Jesus promises to give gifts to the bad and call them his children. And that's the radical thing about God's grace. And that's the radical thing about the, the Christmas season is that though you and I are so undeserving, you and I are, are lower than any working class shepherd, that we receive an incredible gift of becoming part now of God's story. That, that because of his sacrifice on the cross, our sins have been dealt with. Because of his resurrection from the dead, we now have a new world to look forward to. 
And, and our participation in that comes as, as being part of the true vine, his, his church, his actual body, the new temple. And, and so when we look at our role within Christmas and within Christianity in general, we, we look to what Jesus told his disciples when one of the last times he was with them. He, he walks into a, a locked room after the resurrection, and he says, listen, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. There was a writer who said that you can spend your entire spiritual life contemplating the two words, as and so. That in the same exact manner that God came to earth, so too do we go out from these doors in, into our neighborhoods, into our family, that we ourselves might follow Christ's example, that we ourselves would take up residence, that we would move into our local neighborhoods, that we would also shine the light of Christ, and the light of truth, and the light of love, and the light of grace into those who so desperately need it. And so this morning as we reflect on all of these things, as we contemplate this whole Christmas season, we, we do so by gathering at some tables around the room where we observe the Lord's table. And what this table means is, is that when we come together to, to take bread and grape juice, we do so because these two things represent the body and blood of Jesus. That, that just as Israel was set free from the exodus and the slavery in Egypt, so too did Christ's shed blood and broken body set us free from the tyranny of self and the tyranny of sin. And so when we take that, we remember what he did for us on our behalf, and, and we also remember what he's going to do for us in his second coming. See, Christmas begins here at the birth of Jesus, but, but the great consummation of the entire Christian story is the return of Jesus, that the whole world would not be filled with Christmas lights, but the lights of Christ himself, that God himself would be present eternally here on earth. In fact, the book of Revelation, also written by John, talks about the fact that, that Christ's followers look forward to a marriage supper of the Lamb, that, that when we fi are finally reunited with God, when we encounter God yet again, that we're having a marriage supper of the Lamb. And so this communion time this morning is, is in part to remember Christ's sacrifice, yes, but also it's kind of the rehearsal dinner before the great wedding ceremony that we look forward to. And so those of you who have trusted in Jesus as your Savior, we invite you then to come to these tables to remember exactly what this season represents. Not, not merely the fleeting happiness of lights and gifts, but the eternal lasting joy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for your gift of your Son. We're thankful that we can hear your voice um, through your word, through, through Scripture but also see it represented in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, we're thankful for that gift that we receive at Christmas. Lord, we're preparing our hearts now to come to these tables. Um, Lord, I ask that we come in a worthy manner, that we not take our sins lightly. Um, Lord, I also ask that we not take our sins so lightly that we think that um, being sorry um, is good enough. Um, to make us worthy of your table, but instead to, to lean so heavily on your grace um, that we recognize that, that our worth is not wrapped up in how religious we are or even how unreligious we are, but only in your son's incredible performance for us on the cross. Lord, I, I pray this morning that if anyone is here who doesn't yet know your son um, that they would take time to seek someone out, uh, even myself, and, and receive for the very first time this incredible gift of your grace. We ask all these things in your Son's name and by the power of your Spirit. Amen.